places for their ancestral homeland. For those viewers watching this evening who would like closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via, via our YouTube page. To enable real-time closed captioning, you can click the CC button on the bottom right corner of the video player. This video will also be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast, both here on uh, Crowdcast and on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Uh, we're thrilled to be um, bringing these events to you virtually. We hope that you'll consider making a donation by clicking on the donate button at the bottom of your screen or becoming a town hall member. You can make a donation online or text town hall to 44321 to give. Tonight's presentation will be about 35 minutes followed by a Q&A session. Jackie Heldgott from Seattle University will select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. We ask that you keep your questions concise and in the form of a question, and we will try to get through as many as we can. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support, the support of our sponsors, and all of our Town Hall members. Please join me in welcoming Kurt Bloodsworth and Jackie Heldgott from Seattle University. Hello, uh, it, it's, I'm Jackie Helfgott from Seattle University. Uh, I'm from the Department of Criminal Justice where we have undergrad and grad programs and a certificate program in crime analysis. Uh, and I'm the director of the Crime and Justice Research Center where we have uh, continuing ed and training events, research and service on crime and justice issues. Um, we also have an annual continuing ed event, the death penalty in the age of data science and abolition. And we're co-sponsoring this event tonight because Kirk Bloodsworth will be speaking at that event uh, tomorrow. Kirk Bloodsworth is the first person in the United States to be exonerated from death row based on DNA testing. In 1984, he was arrested for the rape and murder of nine-year-old Don Hamilton. He was sentenced to death in Baltimore County, Maryland in 1985. In 1989, Kirk read about a new forensic breakthrough called DNA fingerprinting, and in 1992, lobbied successfully for prosecutors' approval for its use on evidence collected at the crime scene in 1985. The tests uh, incontrovertibly established Kirk's innocence, and he was released in June 1993 after nine years in prison, two of which were sp uh, spent on death row. Today, Kirk serves on the executive, as the executive director of Witness to Innocence, the nation's only organization dedicated to empowering exonerated death row survivors to be the most powerful and effective voice in the struggle to end the death penalty in the United States. Kirk Bloodsworth has devoted himself to abolishing the death penalty and addressing wrongful convictions, and he has testified before the United States Congress, as well as numerous state legislatures. He is co-author of the book Bloodsworth, uh, the true story of the first de death row inmate exonerated by DNA evidence. And he's the subject of the documentary Bloodsworth, an Innocent Man. And on a personal note, I want to say Kirk has come to Seattle University to speak to our students year after year after year. Um, and he has been instrumental in educating undergraduate and graduate students about the, the harms that comes from the, the death penalty and in educating people on a national level uh, and, and worldwide about um, issues uh, that have come from the death penalty in, in America. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to, to Kirk. And uh, again, it's a great uh, honor uh, to welcome our guest, Kirk Bloodsworth, tonight. Hello, uh, Seattle and Town Hall. How, I hope you guys are faring this uh, uh, you know, stand in place orders and 
doing our things in this uh, really trying time. In 1984, I was an honorably discharged Marine. Never been arrested for anything in my life. I, uh, I went to high school, a Christian high school in 11th to 12th grade. I, uh, I joined the Marine Corps at 17, went in early at my parents signed for me to go and I went and uh, I came out, uh, you know, uh, four years later and uh, wanted to figure out what I was going to do in my life, you know, how to be discharged guy. And so in my, where I'm from is uh, the Dorchester County, Maryland, on Maryland's Eastern shore. And most of the Bloodsworths that, uh, that grew up in, in that town, became fishermen and I was, uh, you know, one myself. My father was one, his father. As a matter of fact, there's a there's an island in the Chesapeake Bay uh, named after my family called Bloodsworth Island. You know, we were a blue collar, working class bunch of, uh, you know, family. And, you know, I did, wanted to work on the water and I worked in the business with my father and did all this thing. But, in 19, uh, uh, I guess it was the winter of 1984, I met my first wife, uh, Wanda, who uh, was from Baltimore. Uh, Dorchester County and the town I come from, uh, Cambridge, Maryland, is about 100 some miles from Baltimore and, and Essex. And I got married in April of that year um, to a gal from Baltimore. You know, we, uh, I don't know, we fell in love and I wanted to be with her. So I decided to leave the fisherman's life and go to Baltimore. Uh, my my wife was missing. She, she didn't like, uh, there's a lot of hours as a fisherman, as a commercial fisherman. You know, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not the Bering Sea fishing that you guys probably know about, but certainly... It was six days a week, uh, you know, uh, 15, 16 hours a day all summer from, you know, uh, May until October. I met Wanda in, uh, in Baltimore with some friends at a, a local uh, bar up there. And I was 23 years old. I didn't know that this chance meeting would cause me you know, and our marriage would cause me any kind of strife whatsoever. I just wanted to, you know, get married and, uh, and, and make a living and, you know, try to be honest at it. It seemed to um, change for the worse, though. On July 25th, 1984, a little girl by the name of uh, Dawn Hamilton had been found brutally murdered in a wooded area near her home. A search had ensued for the killer, who was described as, and I wish I was standing in front of you all so I could tell you the difference here, but it was described as follows. Six foot five, curly blonde hair, bushy mustache, tan skin, and skinny. I was about six foot tall, weighed 200 some pounds uh, back in this. My hair was as red as an apple. Back in those days, I wore glasses, had a missing tooth in the front. And, um, you know, certainly wouldn't tan because I was a redhead. You know, it's um, never thought in my wildest imagination or nightmare that I'd ever be accused of something like this. My wife and I at the time were having troubles and. I had went up there on 4th of July weekend. I, I wound up leaving August 4th weekend, a month later. I had to leave Wanda. She was, uh, we just didn't see the eye to eye on what marriage was like. Um, and it turned out, you know, that the young boy, she was 10 years my senior. She just didn't want to be married, I don't think. And so I went back to Cambridge. Um, this whole thing started by a next door neighbor I was living in uh, when I was living with Wanda. 
in Baltimore when the crime happened. It was all over the news. It was everywhere. It was in the papers and people were looking. And so it all started from an anonymous tip that came in on the Baltimore County. This is where Dawn was murdered in Baltimore County, Maryland. About a man, and she said, and I quote, the composite sketch looks like my neighbor, Kirk. So the police uh, went over to where I was supposed to be, I guess, they thought. And I had already left, uh, uh, you know, Wanda uh, by August 4th and went back to my hometown of Cambridge. I was hoping to get my commercial fishing uh, job back that I was with this other commercial crabber. Um, you know, we call it blue crabs, and uh, you know, it's just it didn't seem to work out. Next thing I know, on August 9th, 1984, at 2:45 in the morning, there was a bang on my cousin's door where I was staying. Boom, boom, boom! Open up. It's the Baltimore County Police Department, and I went to the front door, I was standing there and I had a pair of silk running shorts on that I wore back then and no shirt, no shoe. Uh, it was a hot summer uh, back in 1984. And he said, step outside, Mr. Lutherford, if you're under arrest. First degree murder of Dawn Venice Hamilton, you son of a bitch. Jazz like that. I told them from the start, I had nothing to do with the, with the crime. I heard about it through the news and through the, uh, uh, you know, TV news and the, and the newspapers, just like everybody else. I, you know, I kept telling them, I, was, I didn't have any money. I couldn't afford a really good lawyer. I uh, wound up spending, uh, you know, about $50,000 that my father had. He actually mortgaged his house to try to help me. And, uh, Next thing I know, I was on uh, you know, Baltimore County Detention Center waiting to go to trial, and they were seeking the death penalty in my case. Now, there was a lot of suspects in this case. There was a suspect that came in eight days before I was arrested, a man that was uh, uh, seen the day of the murder running, uh, you know, was far from it, running and wiping his face off, and, but nobody went back to check that guy. Just remember that. And uh, because of the honest tip, they came, and, you know, uh, there was two calls on the, on the, uh, on the police tip line, and uh, they came in and wanted to find me right away. So they came to Cambridge, took me back from Cambridge, and rode me all the way up to Baltimore. And that's where the nightmare really started. I told them I was innocent. I had no idea. Um, I couldn't do anything like they were suggesting. And there was no physical evidence in the case whatsoever other than the eyewitnesses. Now, they arrested me on a uh, Thursday, August 9th. So they wanted to hold a lineup on uh, that Monday, that coming Monday. And they called all the witnesses in the case and told them not to watch television. We were arrested a suspect. And by the way, his name is Kirk Busberg. And there was five uh, identification witnesses in all who positively said it was me that they saw. They came to the lineup and the two main witnesses were two little boys, eight and 10 years of age, who had seen this person uh, supposedly walking off into the woods with Dawn Hamilton leading the way. She had had a sleepover that night before and, uh, uh, and, and was playing a game of hide and go seek with her friends that day and uh, uh, came across these two little boys who were fishing and uh, asked them if they could help her find her friends of course, they declined. They had just caught this turtle. It's more interested in that. And uh, but this man on the rise of a hill spoke up and said he could uh, he could help her find her friends. And uh, with Dawn leading the way, and that was the last time she was seen. She was found two thirty that afternoon uh, in a pile of leaves. And I I have to tell you, uh, it's a graphic crime. 
this is the worst thing in the world that could ever be done to anybody. And it's, uh, to a child, my goodness. Um, so they were interested in getting the person. Now, they held this lineup on that Monday, as I was telling you. Now, the two main witnesses came, and neither one of them identified me in the lineup. It wasn't until two weeks later, they, they called, their parents called the police department and said their, uh, uh, their children had made a mistake. It was really number six. And that's the position I stood in in the lineup. And then the snowball started. Eight months later, I was sitting in a trial with all these people, yeah, leering at me, cursing me for what they believed I had done. And I was vehement about my innocence. I told them, you know, I was I shouted from the top of my lungs as much as I could. I was not guilty. I had nothing to do with this thing. Um, but I didn't have Perry Mason, if some of you are old enough to know who that guy is, or, you know, uh, Johnny Cochran, or none of these guys. This is the guy I have. Now, I want you to picture a prison visiting room, okay? Now, your lawyer, the first lawyer I ever had, so he comes in off the street, he's going to represent, he's representing me in this case. He comes off the street, sits with his back to a brick wall. And we have to talk through the glass, so we have to get on the phone to talk through the glass. And he's sitting with his back to a brick wall, and the first thing out of his mouth, he says, uh, Kirk, you're in a lot of trouble. I thought that was very astute of him right away. He says, but don't worry. I know my way around the courtroom. We're going to find our way out of here together. We talked about the case about 20 minutes, and one of only three visits this man came to see me before I went to, uh, was sentenced to death um, eight months later. And right before he gets ready to leave, uh, he reiterated, saying, he says, Kirk, I know my way around the courtroom. We're going to find our way out of here together. He put his hand on the glass to say goodbye, picked up his briefcase, turned around, and ran right in the wall. It wasn't funny then, but that was the funniest thing that ever happened in my whole time I was in there. And, you know, read the book, you know, talk about all that stuff. I wound up getting death and double life. When the gavel came down on my death, the courtroom erupted in applause. Give him the gas and kill his ass, they were saying. They partied until two or three o'clock in the morning for my execution. I wound up spending eight years, 10 months and 19 days in prison and two years on death row for something I had nothing to do with. Now, I'm not really going to talk about the prison stuff because, you know, honestly, it's, um, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, you, what do you all think? A man accused of killing a nine-year-old child, what's going to happen to him in his prison experience? It wasn't beautiful. I mean, I fought and I got hit in the back of the head with a sock full of batteries. And I remember them taking me in that cell that first night and that door, big door slamming shut, you know. He's about 300 pounds or more. And uh, my life was over at 20 three years old. I became a prison librarian uh, when I was in there about, I think, six years in. They let me uh, become this librarian. And one day I happened uh, to get three books in the mail. I had no idea where they come from. To this day, I still have no idea, but they were dressed to me. I might have sent it to one of them Columbia book clubs. I don't know. One of my family might have done that. But I got this book in the mail, and it was called The Bloody by Joseph Wombo. And it detailed the accounts of the first time a new technology was used in criminal uh, you know, trials, uh, DNA testing. Uh, as it turned out, uh, this fellow who developed it, Alec Jeffries, was the founding father of genetic fingerprinting found this uh, 
information uh, or DNA testing uh, back right around the same time I was uh, convicted and sentenced to death, which I find very ironic. Anyhow, I uh, I was real interested in this, you know, because I remember, you know, there was no physical evidence, never found, no fingerprints, no nothing, but they did have semen on Dawn's underclothes and some other uh, things. And so I remember they were swabbings and, uh, uh, you know, all these slides and different things, many spermatozoacene, it said. So I wrote the prosecutor myself, said, look, I want to take this new test called DNA testing or uh, genetic fingerprinting, and I want to prove my innocence once and for all. She wrote me back a letter and she said, Mr. Buzzworth, we regret to inform you that DNA has been inadvertently destroyed. I, I had no idea what to do at that point. I got so angry, you know, because they withheld evidence. My case was overturned and they withheld evidence about another suspect. And he wasn't the real killer, but I was retried and sentenced to double life. You know, I just didn't have any idea what I was going to do. I didn't belong in this place. So my lawyer at last resort, his name is Bob Warren. He's the chief judge in the uh, Superior Court of Washington, D.C. Um, he's, uh, and he did know his way around the courtroom. I asked him to go look for the DNA evidence that they, uh, the prosecutors said they had inadvertently destroyed. I just didn't believe it. You know, they didn't know where it was. As it turns out, I was right. My lawyer went there to look for the evidence and, you know, he had been there a couple of times. He couldn't find it. And he goes back this last time because I told him if he didn't go, I was going to call him collect uh, 20 times a day. And he said, uh, he, he was going to come back to the prison and tell me he could, still couldn't find it. They probably destroyed it, or whatever. And he happened to pass my law clerk in the second trial, my judges, my second trial judge's law clerk in the, in the hallway. And he says, uh, he says, Bob, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm, I'm looking for the Dawn Hamilton evidence in the Kirk Bloodsworth case. And uh, he said, well, I know where that's at. It was in the judge's closet in a paper bag in a cardboard box sitting on the floor. There was the evidence, Dawn's justice and mine all sitting in a box. Your life shouldn't be relegated to a treasure hunt. Now, it took about a year for the test results to get back. And, you know, I remember that time in my life so vividly. I was 30, I was going on 31, uh, 32 years of age uh, in uh, you know, 1993, on my 33. And anyway, I, you know, I had no idea what was gonna happen. There was a chance that they couldn't find any, any material but it was half of one cell of semen they found on Don's underclothes. And it proved, you know, that I wasn't the one responsible for depositors of the semen. I remember reading that report in April of 1993, but in January of that year, my mother died while I was in prison waiting for the DNA test result. I never got to see her other than five minutes in, a, in her casket, um, flanked by two guards with nine millimeters. And I went back to prison, an innocent man. But this was my life. Now, I have to tell you that on uh, June 28th, uh, coming up next month, uh, I've been out now 28 years. Uh, uh, this year, and uh, but I stepped out of the Maryland penitentiary in a death sentence and a capital conviction, a free man. Eight years, 10 months, and 19 days of my life was gone. And we weren't no closer to find out who the real killer was. I received a pardon 
and three hundred thousand dollars in compensation for my trouble. William Donald Schaefer, the governor of Maryland, pardoned me, and I would receive that little bit of money. It comes to about three dollars something an hour, if you count it like that. But all I ever wanted was to find out who killed Don Hamilton. Another 10 years would pass, and the same prosecutor who called me a monster in two different trials um, was on the other law, on the, on the caller ID. It said Baltimore County government. There were the people that did all this. And it was the same prosecutor. And she said, we will have an update on the Don Hamilton murder case, and we'd like to talk to you. This was in 2003. We were just trying to finish Bloodsworth, the book that's, uh, uh, that you can purchase on this thing. And uh, I, uh, I didn't know what to say to her. She said, well, we need to talk to you. Can I meet you anywhere in, in Maryland? So I met her in Cambridge where I grew up at the Burger King. I like Whoppers. She sat there and told me that they had an update on the murder case and it was Kimberly Shea Ruffner. That was the report that came in eight days before I was arrested. It never went back to check. And he was in the same prison with me for five years in a tier below me and never said a word. And he wasn't six foot five. He was five foot six and 160 pounds. I have to tell you, Don got justice that day. He pled guilty to Dog's murder in May of that, of uh, uh, 2004. And uh, he was arrested three weeks after my original arrest for attempted rape of a woman in Fells Point, Maryland. He kicked in her door and uh, tried to cut her throat. But Dawn and I both had justice that day. I have made it my, my life work to, I'm opposed to the death penalty, straight up. If it could do what it did to me, it can do it to anybody. Anybody. It wants. The death penalty needs to go. And, and you know, I've worked out Washington State with witness innocence. has been out there numerous times over the years to abolish the death penalty. It's just been abolished in, in the state of Washington, and I think it's the best thing that could ever happen. Um, I also abolished it in my home state, helped abolish it, and it took 20 years to do that, but in 2013, we did it. And, um, you know, and I, I work for an organization that's called Witness to Innocence. It's a nonprofit organization that is by and for death row exonerees and their family members. And it's been around for 15, 16, I think 17 years this year. And it was co-founded by uh, Sister Helen Prejean and Ray Crone, another death row exoneree from Arizona. I, I can't say enough that it's important that we put the right people in jail. But uh, we shouldn't be executing people for this very reason. There's 168 exonerated death row survivors in America. We don't need any more. Uh, we need to stop executing people. Um, because if it could happen, uh, if it could happen to me, it can happen to anybody. Don't let it happen. I thank you for your time. And uh, if you got any questions, please be free to ask. Okay, so now we have time for some questions. So if you wanna just, uh, um, you can post your questions in the chat and uh, I will read them out to Kirk.
And I, I can start us off while people are thinking about, uh, oh wait, we might have one here. Okay, we have a question from <laughs> Megan. So uh, 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 the question is, would you consider yourself a prison, a prison abolitionist, why or why not? <laughs> Uh, a prison abolitionist? Yes. Um, meaning to uh, abolish prisons. I'm, I'm sure, yes. Well, you know, I don't know. I think there's a certain sector of society that, I mean, there's people that's going to do us harm. I just don't think we should be executed. Um, I also don't believe we should be mass incarcerating the people for drugs and other stuff like that. You know, we need to change up uh, some of the things that we do and, uh, you know, not go after the pound of flesh and the death penalty certainly does that. Okay, any any other questions? Well, while people are thinking, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you a question, Kirk. Um, you know, I've heard you speak many, many times and I'm always struck by, just you know after your experience being on death row um and just the the you know just the the horrendous experience of all of this that you've described you, you always come across as so hopeful you know year after year you've devoted your entire life to um, helping exonerees and to abolishing the death penalty how, how do you maintain your hopefulness um and then uh related to your work on the, the death penalty, which you're, you're just relentless in terms of 28 years you've been free and you never take a break trying to, um, you know, work uh, for, towards this cause. So what, what more do we, we need to do on this issue? So uh, two questions, how do you maintain your hope and that perspective? And what more do we need to do for those people who are still on the fence or in support of the death penalty? Well, you know, it's uh, we just had an execution the other, the other day, uh, Walter Barton, and the last thing he said, he was an innocent man. And that's what keeps me going, because how can you turn it back if you do make a mistake? Can we bring Mr. Barton back to this world? Could you have brought me back? I don't think so. Um, you know, it's uh, we need to stop doing something. Uh, for the sake of the innocent people that uh, could get accused, you know, we have a a, a prison population of 2.3 million prisoners. I I have to say that uh, we be we can't be taking that you know uh, that much of a chance. And as far as hopefulness, I you know I I try to be as optimistic as I can and do the right thing. Uh, uh, for people that can't speak for themselves, uh, we don't need the death penalty anymore. Uh, we've had it enough, and uh, you know it's 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 obvious that uh, we we got to stop thinking about uh, taking somebody's life. There's enough things in this world that takes our lives that we need to be focused on. Okay, we have a couple other questions that have come in um, from Carolyn. Uh, I don't know all of the detail, but I've heard that in Norway, there's no such thing as a sentence more than 20 years, regardless of the crime. From your point of view, do, do they somehow look at life and themselves differently? Would that system work here in the United States? I, I'm not sure if the system would work here or not, but certainly... Uh, a person can't do a thousand years. Uh, you know, I think the draconian uh, sentencing that we've had over the, uh, you know, over the years has, um, we need to make a change. And we need to start getting these, some of these, uh, you know, making, politicians making the, the fact that it's, being tough on crime, you're not being tough on crime, I think. I think you're tough on society. We need to start acting a way to find out a way to get these offenders in a different way um, and not keep putting uh, disenfranchised and other people and, and, and just mass incarcerating people. You know, we it was only like three, I don't even think it was 300,000 
just a few years ago. And now we're almost up to 3 million. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're going about this the wrong way. We cannot incarcerate our way out of this. I, I, I really say that. So I think Norway should be uh, maybe one of many examples. I, I, you know, I think a person should be a, give a chance to repent uh, and, uh, you know, or rehabilitate themselves or herself. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question uh, from Candace. Are there connections that you made during your time in prison that you still keep up with today? Uh, yeah, I, I, I had some good friends. I was, uh, there's another the guy, he's, uh, he just got out, but he took an alpha plea. He, we were in this you know, right next door to each other on death row. We were both on death row at the same time. Um, he's out now and, and, you know, making face shields for people, um, for this, uh, pandemic we got going on and, um, you know, it's, uh, I have that, but, and then here's, here's a neat one. So just a few months ago, two of the guys that I was on the bus with, uh, they were, they were both rap buddies and they had the same charges. But uh, they had uh, Chestnut and Ransom. They both, uh, we were on the bus together 36 years ago, and they just got exonerated by the Maryland, uh, uh, Maryland Mosby uh, prosecutor in Baltimore. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, uh, I try to do the best I can and, uh, and uh, keep in touch with those folks. I, but we don't have a death penalty anymore, so. Not in the state of Maryland, anyway. Okay, uh, we have another question uh, from, let's see, uh, uh, from Megan. What advice do you have for folks in the audience who'd like to help advocate for the end of the death penalty? Join Witness to Innocence. I mean, that's the best, one of the best ways to do it, support our programs. We have a program that's similar to this, where um, we have three exonerees speak, and it's facilitated by uh, a lawyer uh, who's on the board and uh, it's called Accuracy and Justice. So we also, um, are, I'm doing a virtual speaking uh, engagements for all of our members and uh, support witness to innocence and support abolition. Um, there's a ton of ways you can do it, but witness to innocence, we, uh, we can help you. So. That's witnessdennis.org. Okay. And then someone was asking, oh, someone asked, Mary Kay, or Kay uh, has asked, uh, can you explain the Alfred plea that you mentioned? Well, the Alfred plea is a plea where you maintain your innocence, but you are saying that the, 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 the court uh, or the prosecutor or whatever it might uh, convict you anyway. So you're submitting... To that, but you're maintaining your instance. I mean, that's how I've learned it to be. I I have to say that I find that uh, plea uh, unconstitutional myself. I think it takes away from your original plea of not guilty. So now you have to have, and it's all be, they use it uh, specifically for the ex express purpose of uh, you can get out. But if they were going to let you out, why they got to make a special plea for you? You're innocent or not, and I I think that uh, it's unfair because people need uh, compensation after that, and that's a good way to avoid uh, states and to avoid it. They use it as a as a tool. Okay, uh, and then uh, we have a question from Esther. Uh, did they find the real killer of Don? Yes, that's what I was ending up, uh, Esther. It's uh, he was uh, he was caught ten years after. Uh, I was released, um, and he was in prison with me below in a tier. Uh, but he was not six foot five; he was five foot six, sixty pounds. Okay, let's see another question we have from Candice. Is there any impact on death penalty policy in states, given that our prison system is more and more a for-profit system? I'm not quite sure uh, what the question is she's asking here. Um, let's see. I think the question is, uh, let's 
see. Is there impact on death penalty policy in states given that our prison system is more and more a for, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, Candice, if you wanna post another uh, follow-up question to that, but my guess is that question has to do with given that our prison system is more and more a for-profit system, does that have any impact on death? Uh, I'm guessing the question is any impact on the death penalty in states that have not yet abolished it? I think it's, you know, pretty dangerous, uh, actually. So, you know, you uh, may, you know, I I'm against for, for profit prisons, you know, the states should, should handle these things. And uh, you become a worded state and the, the idea that you get more punishment when you go to prison outside of you being taken away from society is not the case. You get 10 years, that's all you're supposed to do is 10 years of your time inside of for whatever crime you committed. Um, I, I just think it, it gives an opportunity because if you're for profit, then you need bodies. So they had this fellow right here in Pennsylvania, I think uh, is a judge or uh, that sentenced, uh, you know, was pushing all these young kids to this, pro, uh, you know, for profit prison here in, in the state. We can't do that anymore. So uh, there is no way, uh, I think they should ban all profit for profit prisons in America. Okay, and then yeah, Candace clarified more, if our prison system was more government run, would it be easier to pass policy that prohibits the death penalty? So if there were, if there were no privatization of any aspect of... I, I don't know, it's, it's up to the legislature in any case. And so mm -hmm. I, I think the, the legislatures have to realize, as Washington did and Maryland did, that it is not worth it. Um, you spend far too much money. It's, um, you know, the arbitrary and every other kind of thing you can think of. Um, uh, racial disparity, uh, I can keep going on. It's just, it's not worth it to for our society. I think it needs to be. We've had it long enough, so. Please. Okay, and let's see, we have another question from Megan. What has been the most impactful way for you to make change? Well, stand up against, uh, you know, the, what you feel is right in life. Uh, if you know it's true, and then other people saying it's not, don't just say, well, just because they're, they have a higher position in life that they're, they're right. You know, you, you know it's wrong. Uh, nobody would want to execute an innocent person, not any logical way, I don't think. But if they still do it, there is a chance they will. And we can't take that chance. Just got to stand up against it and don't stop. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, do we have any other questions? I was wondering too, Kirk, you haven't mentioned your exoneree rings. Do you want to mention the work that you've been doing on those? Yeah, uh, I don't, uh, I have to run and get it. I, I got it um, on the keychain, but um, I have an exoneree ring project that um, you could probably go online and see a, a picture of it. If I, um, it's, I started a couple years ago and it's, um, I became a jeweler about, I don't know, five, six years ago and had this idea to make this ring for exonerees from death row. And then I turned it into exonerees. You know, we have over 2,000 some exonerees in America today and nobody's ever given them anything. So I designed this ring. You can look um, and try to find it on my pictures. If you look up Bloodsworth Ring Project, you'll be able to find it. There's one just me holding. I think uh, there's a poster with me doing that from Philly. So um, I've already given out, and they're free to exonerees. Now, somebody's got to help pay for it, but uh, and they cost about 150 a piece and uh, to get them made, uh, uh, depending on the price of sterling silver at the time. But I designed it, made it myself, and it looks like an empty cell. And the uh, engraving on it was done by a woman who works uh, for Tiffany's and um, uh, Marlon Hazel and uh, Nancy uh, 
uh, Winthrop uh, both helped me with this, but I designed the ring and and, uh, and they make the cassocks. So we, we've given out a 250. You can uh, go to, I think, the Innocent Project and uh, donate to the, the ring project itself on that um, and, and help out. But, you know, I, I've got a bunch more I'm getting ready to give out uh, soon. So. Okay, and then I'll ask one last question. I'll give anybody else who has uh, who wants to ask a question just a minute here to think of another question. Um, but given all the people that you have worked with, all of the exonerees, can you talk a little bit about the experience that people have coming out? Like, do they get compensation from the states where they're wrongly convicted? What what has is if you could in a nutshell explain the experience for people after they're hey. exonerated? There is nothing that is waiting for you when you get out on exoneration. If you have family, and, uh, and of course, family is going to help you, but there is nothing. The states and the, some people have good policies, and uh, you know, but trying to get them and jump through all those hoops. You know, I I came up with a program in two thousand and three. Um, uh, I mean, excuse me, in two thousand, called uh, the Kirk Bloodsworth Post Conviction DNA Testing Program. You know, that's a federal law, and we've gotten over 50-some people out of prison based on that to defray the cost of DNA testing. I mean, uh, my goodness, it's, uh, I, you know, join Witness Innocence, and uh, we, we can certainly point you in the right directions and uh, try to get you going, but the death penalty has got to go. And, uh and, uh, you know, we need to compensate. There's no compensation laws for, for exonerated people. There's actually things in place for people who committed a crime when they get out. And it's called the Second Chance Act. We need uh, something on a federal level that it helps these uh, men and women. Because um, there's two women now that for, from death row that are exonerated, found them innocent. Uh, both of them are members of my organization. Sabrina Butler and uh, and uh, um, uh, Deborah Milkey from Arizona. So, you know, there is no law, no f managing thing that can give you any kind of compensation or help you when they get out. And uh, it's just like, here you go, you know, you make it up. No compensated, people get better, more, uh, money these days than he did back when I started, but you know, we need a compensation law from the federal government. And also, where does all your Social Security go? We need to reestablish their annuity for the Social Security for the time they lost. I'm all for that. There is nothing for that either. There's a big 10-year gap in my Social Security giving. Uh, so, I, you know, that money I was going to, when I retire. Well, what's going to happen to that? So there's a lot that needs to be done. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, we will um, wrap it up. And I'll just say, um, you know, it's always an honor to spend time with you, uh, Kirk. And I do want to put another plug for Bloodsworth. You can, there's a little button at the bottom. You can uh, buy Bloodsworth. And and uh, I have to say, you know, I, I require this class, every graduate student who comes to Seattle University Criminal Justice Department reads this book. And I have, you know, we have students coming in all the time who are uh, on the fence about the death penalty or really just don't understand um, all of the aspects um, of the death penalty and, and wrongful convictions. And, and, and this story has just been so powerful um, for students of criminal justice, but, but, um, but for everyone. And so I just highly recommend um, uh, this book. Uh, I also want to mention uh, we have this uh, all-day event tomorrow at uh, Seattle University uh, Criminal Justice Department. Um, I know we have a few spots left, but it's called Data, uh, Death, The Death Penalty in the Age of Data, Science, and Abolition. We'll have Kirk Bloodsworth with us tomorrow, also Sister Helen Prejean, 
and uh, King County Prosecuting Attorney Dan Satterberg, um, and also other speakers. Um, we have uh, poets from uh, Strange uh, Fruit, uh, po poetry, poems on the death penalty, and uh, speakers from the Washington Innocence Project and researchers. So that's that event. Also, Town Hall Seattle tomorrow night is featuring Sister Helen Prejean at uh, 7.30. And so I hope uh, everyone can join uh, Town Hall Seattle tomorrow night for that event. And uh, I will just thank you all for the great questions and for everyone uh, for being here tonight and turn it over to Shane. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you both to you, Jackie and Kurt, for being here this evening. Uh, it was really an honor having you both here. Um, thank you, everybody else who tuned in this evening. Uh, if you enjoyed this event, you can find many more like it on our website, townhallseattle.org. And as Jackie mentioned, we have another event with Seattle University tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time featuring Sister Helen Prejean. Uh, we hope you will consider making a donation to Town Hall Seattle. Your support will allow us to continue uh, to provide events just like the one this evening. If you're interested in learning more about Kirk's story, you can purchase a copy of Bloodsworth, the true story of the first death row inmate exonerated by DNA evidence. You can use the link uh, on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at the Elliott Bay Book Company. And finally, thank you again for being here tonight. Stay safe and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.